All right, welcome, welcome. If you're new to the channel, my name's Elliot and you're watching Rickety Ski Reviews. Today, we're gonna be talking about the drama between Pink Bike and some of the things they said and talking about just companies that do reviews, that do biking content and how they talk about fan footage, how they talk about just normal GoPro footage. We're gonna be reacting to the Lone Ranger and you know, shout out to this guy. He did a great kind of analysis. He had some really good takes. So we're gonna be reacting to his content today. But just to give you an overview, basically on the podcast for Pink Bike, which is a company like that not only does mountain biking content, but I believe they also sell bikes or I, I wanna say it's like a way of buying used bikes. I could be misinformed, but that's how I know them when I was shopping for bikes years ago. Now, I'm not that integral to the mountain biking community. I'm in my own little ski world, but I've had some pretty similar experiences to these guys. So basically one of the hosts was saying, it's fine if you wanna shoot your own GoPro footage, but posting on YouTube, it's a little much. And what did they say? They also said, you see a lot of this GoPro footage and these people are doing these big mountain bike lines at Whistler, but then they're having to walk them. And, and being like a small creator and kind of being new to this and dealing with some of these same issues, I thought I'd kind of give my two cents. So we're gonna react today. First off, my take on this is saying things like that is so incredibly out of touch. And I think that it comes from a place not only of like arrogance, but also insecurity. One thing I've noticed just in doing ski content is that people don't actually care that much about you being like a professional level skier. For years, I've always kind of avoided making ski content just because I grew up through the Burke Mountain Academy program. I know that there are like much better skiers than me out there. And so I said, okay, well, I, that should be safe for someone like Ted Ligety or someone like a D1 skier from BMA, people I grew up with. And what I've come to realize after watching a lot of their content, um, even people like Bodie and Lindsey Vaughn, even Michaela Schifrin, I've followed them for years after working for Ski Racing Magazine, and I found that their content isn't all that interesting or relatable. I look at people like Lucas Cadiana, I look at someone like Lucas, and he is not the best skier in the world. He's not, there are much better skiers. I'm not either, but he's a really good storyteller. He does really good edits, he puts together really good angles, he makes you feel the experience of an opening day, and that's what matters. If you watch like Ski Racing Magazine's YouTube channel, it's like 600 views for Darren Rawls, who's one of the best skiers of all time. So I think that professional athletes or people who are pros, they get intimidated by this because the average person doesn't need to see a pro level athlete, whether it's mountain biking or skiing. And in my opinion, the kind of content I like to watch, and it seems like other people like to watch, is character driven. It's personality driven. It's the person that you're watching and the story that they're telling. I think these people are honestly insecure. They're worried about some guy with a little GoPro kind of eating their lunch because it's one thing to be a professional and it's another thing to be like a good storyteller. I know that I kind of rip on curated for having these people who are like not the best skiers and I'll critique them, but my bigger point is just that they say that they're ski experts. I think that they just are kind of overselling themselves, right? And so they're saying things about skis that are really confident and some of it's not true. So all I'm trying to do is point out, hey, this is true, what they're saying is accurate for consumers, this part isn't. I'm not trying to just beat up on them, that's not the point of this channel. The point of the channel is just call out baloney when you see it and help people understand what things are accurate and what things aren't. But there are people who are intermediate skiers who might have a better perspective on intermediate skis. They might have a better perspective on knowing what people who are new need to know, things that they needed to do to jump from beginner to intermediate and so on. So this idea that only pros no, I would say it's the opposite. Like sometimes pros can be out of touch with what the average skier goes through. One of my big critiques when I saw a few ski quiver videos, right? Where people had five, 10 pairs of skis. I go for the average person, they're not gonna go out and buy five pairs of skis their first season. So what does it look like for an average real skier to buy skis? But anyway, that's enough of my opinion. Let's go in and see what the Lone Ranger has to say. And here we go. Hey, so two of the Pink Bike Tech editors uh, a little a little while back said a couple of things that like one it was like kind of surprising and disappointing that it could go something like this could go over their heads so badly and two was absolutely infuriating to me and i haven't been able to stop thinking about it since i lost sleep last night so here we are we're putting a pause on regular video production 
because I think this is pretty important to talk about. All right, there have been a number of sort of off-color comments towards the rest of the mountain bike creator community out there, mostly from one specific tech editor, but the, what we're really talking about today are some very specific things that I can specifically point to. And that was a part of the Pink Bike Podcast, episode 198, our pedantic pet peeves. I'll link it below in the description. And there are kind of like two specific moments that I'm referencing here, and I'll play them for you right now. Because I think a lot of time with social media, and you know, even to when I was working essentially as an influencer, back in the day like if i could have been a, a mountain bike racer that's what i would have done but how, how did that feel like thinking like we're actually doing the actual thing the racing and if a lot of those influencers if they could do this they would be doing this but they can't but they're doing tiktok dances and making like pov guides or whatever about like the best trail in bc watch me walk it you know? <laughs> <laughs> like we have to do something there's just like gigabytes and gigabytes of just like people bumbling down easy trails which is great like you can remember your it's fine to document your adventures and things on GoPro, like go for it. But I do feel like maybe uploading it to YouTube is too much, maybe. All right, so let's cover the first thing. It's the easiest one. We can breeze past this and get to- What an insane, self-righteous thing to think. You know what I mean? Let me come at this from skiing and ski racing. I ski raced, but I did not ski race professionally. I ski raced USSA. I did the Bergman Academy Junior Program, which is like one of the best ones in the country but I was like the worst person in it. <laughs> so you know, I about average out. Uh, and then I raced high school. I raced USSA open races and then I raced in college. USCSA, which is like, there's only D1 in USCSA. I would say I don't wish that I was a professional skier. I think when I was like a teenager, maybe I thought that would be really cool and I idolized that. But now being an adult, I understand that there's sacrifices that come with that. I know people who went through maybe like the US ski team A team, but also like through the B team and kind of through those ranks. I know people who are still kind of hanging on to that dream into their mid thirties. And it's like, there's more to life, you know? When I think back on my racing career, I think the biggest regret I have is just that I took it so seriously. <laughs> The things I remember are not at all the results. I couldn't even tell you like any of my college results. I don't remember any of like the specific results. What I mostly remember is the friends that I made, the people that I sat on the bus with, the people that we went out to dinner with during races. These are people that I still call, that I still talk to, that I still send congratulation cards when they have children. Those are the things that were important to me and I was lucky that I had a really good college coach, Ron Bonneau, who kind of suggested this to me when I was a freshman and not ready to hear it and then kind of kept slowly being like, what's the most important thing for today? That today was your best day ever, that you enjoyed this. It was really simple but looking back on it now, I'm like, wow, that was a really good philosophy. And when I see people like this that go, oh, all content creators wish that they could be pro athletes. Wow, go touch some snow. <laughs> I guess you can't touch grass, so touch snow. Dude, people have lives outside of this sport, whether it's biking, skiing, whatever. I bet a lot of people don't actually wish that they were pros. They're probably just trying to enjoy their hobby. I know a lot about skiing. I know a lot about ski racing. I'm a USSA level 100 coach, which was, I didn't learn anything from that class really. It wasn't like groundbreaking. I, when I got the certification, I wasn't like suddenly a better coach. Uh, same for, I'm a USSA certified race referee, which means I can sanction people on the race and I measure how far apart the gates are and I make sure a course is safe and fair. But does that matter? No, <laughs> it doesn't matter at all. It doesn't make me more certified to tell you what skis are good or bad, but people kind of latch onto these credentials that separate them from the average person. And it's like, it doesn't matter. So I think believing that everybody wants to be a professional biker, skier, whatever, is like totally out of touch. That's, it's just, I think that skiing is like a really great lifetime sport. I feel similarly about biking. When I'm not skiing, I'm mountain biking. And it's like, it's fun for me. It's a good way to stay in shape for ski season, but I in no way wish I was a professional biker. Just this idea that people are clambering to be a professional biker is like, most people have complex lives going on and biking is just a fun hobby. And they watch this kind of content to get better. Anyway, that's a long rant, let's keep going. The really maddening stuff. Uh, the first one is just kind of a head scratcher. So Henry Quinney says and seems to believe that mountain bike content creators out there, they all just want to be pro racers so, so badly, but they can't do it. And because they can't do it, they're going and doing TikTok dances. I mean, yeah, what he said is ridiculous and demeaning. It really just shows that he's not in touch with 
the reality of mountain bike content creation at, at the moment. I'm part of a really amazing Slack group where there's a ton of us mountain bike content creators on there. Uh, people that focus on Instagram or TikTok and a ton of YouTubers. And I don't know if any single one of them, maybe one of them wanted to be a racer and they were a racer. And then they found that making content was more fun and they got way more out of it in general. But everybody else that I know, everybody, hundreds of people who are content creators out there, I none of them wants to be racers. I'd be willing to bet that the vast majority of mountain bikers don't really care about racing. So I think it comes from a bit of an old school mindset. And I get it. I follow racing like crazy. I don't want to be a racer, but uh, I, I follow it and I enjoy watching it. Maybe a little less so this past year, but that's a whole nother video. But yeah, to say that making mountain bike content is like a step down from something else, um, I think it's pretty out to lunch and out of touch. But that's okay. That was his hot take. I think it's wrong going from the experience of, of the people that I know. Um, but let's. I would say that's true for ski racing too. There's this idea that ski racing is the perfect way to ski that if you're doing it like Michaela Schiffrin, that's perfect. But what you would learn from some of these US ski team guys is that there's like different forms that ski in different ways. Back when Bodie Miller was kind of at his peak, everybody wanted to ski like Bodie. Everyone would ski in the back of their boots. They would kind of take the straightest line. And when Ted Ligeti came along, it became more about fundamentals and downhill skis. And if you skied like Ted, you would get coached into a Bodie mindset because Ted was still kind of up and coming. And so there's always this idea of like peak performance and it's total baloney. People have different ski styles. I've coached people who have the most insane ski styles where they're dragging their knuckles and their butts almost on the ground but then they win the race. So it's a big misconception that everybody is clambering to kind of go after this peak performance. I would also say a lot of people don't care about ski racing. Ski racing has gotten so just pompous over the years. Oh, well, if you don't have this race ski, then you're not a real racer. And oh, well, if you're not doing chili camps in the summer, are you a real ski racer? And it's just over time pushed people out of the sport. I famously, when I was 12, quit ski racing just because I was sick of getting yelled at. I was sick of being told, oh, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong by either my parents or by ski coaches. And so I said, okay, I quit. And what did I do? I went and snowboarded because nobody I knew could tell me I was snowboarding wrong. All I wanted to do was get better at snowboarding so I could go explore different parts of the mountain and I just enjoyed doing it. And by doing it, I got better. I quit all of my team sports and started biking because even if you're bad at biking, you can go and bike. But when we were at Mount Hood, I saw the BMA Junior program. I saw a coach yelling at these 10 year olds. Oh, what are you doing? You need to get back in line. We, we, we guys need to pay attention. Time to wake up. It's like nine o'clock in the morning. These kids are like 10 to 12, something like that. And I just thought if anyone yelled at my kids like that, I would lose it. This is just supposed to be fun. Who cares? And I think that in a big way over the years, at least in the US, people have kind of lost interest in ski racing. It's more fun to do freestyle skiing. It's more fun to do jumps. It's more fun to kind of go and do powder lines in the backcountry where it's not so rigid and you're doing it wrong. And it's unfortunate because ski racing can be really cool. It can be really fun, but this kind of pompous attitude pushes people away and prevents the sport from growing and being accessible. You know, it's already inaccessible. You have to be in a certain climate. You have to have money for these camps. It's bad enough having this idea that like, this is the perfect way to ski and everybody wishes they could ski this way. It's like, no, most people don't even care about ski racing. People definitely don't follow it. It's not popular at all. It's popular in Europe, but not really in America. And it's become less popular over time. And some of that has to do with like broadcasting rights, things like that. I won't go into the weeds, but yeah, I would say a lot of people don't talk, care about ski racing either. Let's get, let's get to the meat of the matter here. They both talked about um, people say not as skilled as they are making content and putting it out there for other people to see, whether that's on TikTok or Instagram or YouTube or wherever. And between Henry's words and especially his tone, he just he was just putting people down that uh, are out there putting out that content. And Kaz goes even further and and says, well, you know, if you're not a very good rider and you're just bumbling down an easy trail, that's fine for you. But don't don't upload it to the Internet. So I'm going to touch on the absolutely infuriating part of that in a second. But let's go over the, like the utility of people uploading mountain bike content to YouTube, because that's a big one. 
So when I'm gonna go and ride somewhere, I did this before the channel and I especially do it now, I do a lot of trail recon work. I go and look online on Trail Forks, shout out Pink Bike, and I go and I look through every trail preview video that I can get my hands on. And there's all different types of riders and all different skill levels, but in their world, what they're saying should happen is that all of the people that aren't good enough in their mind, they shouldn't upload, they shouldn't put that stuff online because it's just annoying to them. So let's say if their wish came true, let's say, um, if the only person that ever uploaded any trail footage was Remy Metallier, um, great guy. We've had so many great conversations over the years. I consider him a friend. So this is not, there's no dig on Remy here whatsoever. He is such a high level rider. So let's say every trail preview video you would ever look up is from Remy. That would be a big problem because the way Remy rides a trail is very unique. It's extremely high level and is not, I would say relatable to most people. <laughs> he's, he's breezing over parts that would be really, really difficult. And I'm not just talking about crazy features. I'm talking about holding speeds through, through certain things or just sort of floating over stuff that anybody going any slower, you know, he, Remy looks like that. Everyone else would be like this going through the same section. And so I think, I think you know what I'm getting at here is that if you just have one style of very high level rider showing you all the trails, you're gonna show up on that trail and it's gonna be an, a, a very different experience for you. I don't care who you are other than Remy Metallier. I usually only have like a day and a half, maybe two days to be running around in a, any certain trail center. So I wanna know exactly what trails I wanna ride. And that goes whether we're filming a, a video um, I want to see what kind of features are on there. Can I hit this one? Can I not hit that one? Will it show up nicely as a thumbnail? <laughs> Stuff like that. Or when we're going to places and we're not filming and I've got, and I've got the boys with me. I mean, this reminds me of a story. I was once at a race with my friend of mine, Josh, who was significantly better than me. He just like got really good and was crushing me. So we go and they had this warm up trail on the side where you could go and warm up for your slalom run before you went to race. So I had run it a couple times and one of the coaches who was, you know, followed by a trail of little ski racers, he comes up to me and goes, hey, like, would you mind running this course for my kids so they can see like your skiing looks good and I want them to see how you ski it. And I was like beyond flattered. I never got compliments like that. I just, oh my gosh, you know, and I go through the run. It's perfect because little kid courses are easier. <laughs> so you can just kind of pin it. And I get to the end, I go, oh, Josh, you won't believe this. This coach wanted me to ski the course so that his racers could see it. You know, because Josh was better than me and he was always, it was frustrating. I still remember this day, Josh goes to me and goes, well, yeah, it's probably easier for them to learn from somebody who's closer to their ability. And I've never felt so <laughs> devastated, like, oh God. <laughs> Oh, he just had to take me down a notch. But he was right. There, there's, a, there's some truth to that where if somebody is watching and wanting to learn, if you're a beginner, watch an intermediate skier because they've perfected these skills that you're trying to master. If you are a beginner skier and you just try to watch Ted Ligety, you're gonna do some weird things to try to make your body match, but what you're not understanding is the fundamentals that are going into place to make those angles happen. So what does it have to do with this? Well, the reason that's important is people watching the content might be beginners. So if you're an intermediate biker, they may want to watch you to see and learn. This idea that you can only learn from pros is total nonsense. A lot of what you learn from other people are people who are just slightly better than you. In fact, if you really want to get better, you can learn from people who are your same ability or worse because they might be doing one skill really well. A lot of times when I coached, I would pair people, not one good, one bad, but people who had different skills. Maybe one person was perfect with their pole plant and so I wanted the other person to watch and then the other person was perfect with timing their pressure so I wanted them to get that skill and by skiing together they built each other's skills out. This idea that like you can only learn from a pro is not only pompous but it's total baloney because it <laughs> it's not actually the best person for people to learn from. Now if you're an expert sure maybe a pro you can work on one skill or they can explain it well but you have to be somebody who really understands fundamentals. This is gonna be a long video but let's keep going. Er hauling on bikes nowadays, but it wasn't that long ago that I had to be really careful with the trails that I chose to have just that right amount of fun factor, but not going over the line for their skill level. And the only way that I've been able to do that is by being able to view trail preview videos put out by people of all different skill levels. There's so much valuable data other than just the entertainment factor. I love it. And huge shout out to Matt Beer, by the way, who is also part of that podcast. And he instantly jumped in and said, you know, there's it's actually a really great thing that people upload that stuff for trail recon work. He like Matt gets it. And after Matt defended other creators, Henry kind of like 
poked him a little bit more to try and get him to be negative about these people. And Matt wouldn't do it. He just closed his mouth and they moved on. So two thumbs up to Matt Beer. <laughs> now here's the part that makes me equal parts disappointed and angry. Um, it doubles up with what Henry said, but it really hit home when Mike or Kaz, I'll call him Kaz, said that he's worried about the internet filling up with all the crappy GoPro footage of people filming themselves bumbling down trails. It's fine to document your ride, but uploading them to YouTube is a bit much. This is one of the most unprofessional things I've ever heard, and I'll tell you why. So way up on- Not only is it unprofessional, but it's really silly. Like, do you not understand how the internet works, dude? Like, there are so many videos out there, it's not getting full. Uh, yeah, GoPro footage is the least of your worries. I also use ski GoPro footage to, like, see conditions of the mountain. Sometimes it's a really good way to, like, see what a ski area is like. Not all of us can just, like, jet set out to Jackson Hole on a whim. You might see, like, oh, would I like that? I, for example, I hate really narrow, steep runs. It just gives me kind of the spins, especially when the light is flat, and I like these kind of wide open Super G runs. So when I see footage at Sun Valley, I'm like, oh, yeah, I would like that run. And it, you don't have to be pinning all of your turns for me to see that. On their giant media conglomerate owned horse, they say that if you're not good enough of a rider, and you're not riding good enough trails, just don't upload your stuff. The content that they create under the pink bike umbrella, of course, of course they can put their stuff out, but not other people. And so I don't think they're directly talking to me and like the, the crew here at Lone Ranger. And who they're talking to is me from 2014 when I started uploading clips here and there to YouTube or me in 2016 when we started planning out the Lone Ranger channel or me in 2017 when we first started putting out videos. They are talking directly to me and anybody like me in those situations and saying, don't upload your stuff because it's not good enough. Just let us upload our stuff, thanks. And saying those words sucks. But the part that really gets me is the fact that they have a they have an audience. They have a big platform that they're standing on and saying that to so many people, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And when you have that responsibility of a platform like they do and like we do, you cannot like, why would you ever punch down? Like, why would you ever say something specifically to put other people down and to make it so that other mountain bike content creators out there feel bad about themselves, make them think that they shouldn't upload things when anybody can do whatever the hell they want. But also when, when people with a platform talk like that, it opens the floodgates to a bunch of other people that don't really get it and have all these negative thoughts that they're just waiting to share about, you know, a crappy trail video or somebody that didn't hit the big giant jump when they should have. It's just, it's just a bad move all around. Yeah. It blows my mind. It's, like I can tell you right now with confidence that if we move five, 10, 15 years into the future, all of the very best mountain bike storytellers and filmmakers and photographers out there, they're the ones right now who are uploading stuff of them bumbling down easy trails. They're trying to cut their teeth. They're, they're figuring things out right now. Putting yourself out there online is a big deal. It's like, it takes courage to do that. So to try and stop somebody right at the starting gate, uh, yeah, it's madness. These guys have clearly shown that they're very, very intelligent. They're funny, they're good to watch. They put out great content. I could curl up in a nice little ball by the fire and listen to Henry Quinney talk about derailleurs and hate. I'm gonna talk about this because my channel is still pretty new and I've experienced some of this. I have gotten some of the nastiest comments from people in the ski industry. I'm not gonna name any names because I don't know. I don't want anyone to lose their job over a YouTube comment. But I got one from a guy who worked in sales for Stokely just the nastiest and it was like when my channel was pretty new saying you don't have any clue what you're talking about and to his credit i had said basically the stokely strum rider 88 ti that i had from 2018 felt heavy and what i should have said is it's not very buoyant and light powder so like i, I use like slightly different terms but you know he just went in this whole rant he said are you sure you're qualified to do interviews or are you hoping that you can toss on random borrowed content for some side money and then he said maybe you could provide video of you skiing on skis rather than talking under monkey bars which i'm still under the monkey bars this guy is a sales rep for stokely how embarrassing not only is he bashing on me for giving my opinion about the Stokely Storm Rider 88, which I owned. <laughs> but he was also saying that I wasn't qualified, that I shouldn't be making the video, things like that, just to totally demean me. And it's interesting because I think because I grew up racing the BMA junior program, where I just got my teeth kicked in constantly, you know, about my skiing and feeling self-conscious, that I'm like, 
what is he talking about? What is what are his credentials? What are your USSA points? You know what I mean? Like, and I watched, and I saw some video of him skiing, and he skis like an intermediate to advanced skier. Definitely not good enough to race. And that's fine, I, you know, I don't care. When I, I guess what my point is, is like, wow, Stokely, really? This is who you have out representing you? And also, I'm not gonna stop talking about skis. I actually own these skis. I'm giving my first-hand experience. I'm more than qualified, but even if somebody didn't work for Ski Racing Magazine, wasn't a certified USSA level 100 coach or race referee, they should still be able to give their opinions. Anyone can give opinions about a product that they bought. Um, yeah, did it hurt maybe his sales for that quarter? I don't know, probably barely. But what an unhinged thing to say. And I also gave these skis back then, I gave them the Ski of the Year Award. And I just said, hey, over time, they don't float as well in the West, probably skiing them in the East. And that was enough to trigger this person into sending me these long paragraph rants about how I had no idea what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter. Anybody can give their opinion on these skis. Anybody who's owned them can give their opinion. And all these opinions that people give are totally valid. Now, do I like to critique some of it? Absolutely, I look at curated and I go, that isn't how that works. But I've never felt like, well, their opinion isn't valid. I sometimes go like, okay, where did you get that from? But I've never felt like, well, you're not equipped to give this review. And skiing, particularly, has just been one of the gnarliest industries to be in. And I mean, for me, I don't care. <laughs> I'm gonna keep telling you the truth. That's why I'm here. I'm here to tell you the truth about skis I've skied on. And that's it. People ask me in the comments, well, what do you think about the K2 Mindbender 89 Ti? And I go, I didn't ski on it. I skied on the 99 Ti, okay? I don't give opinions about skis I haven't skied on. And anybody of any ability is more than able to give their opinion. Am I critical of curated for some of the ability? Yes, but that's because they're propping these people up as experts where they're definitely beginner to intermediate. That's where I'm critical, where they're saying things, but they are not loading up the ski. Yeah, if you don't have that basic part down, you're not gonna feel some of the intricacies. But does it mean they don't have a good opinion? No, not at all, they have great opinions. You know, if you're a beginner and an intermediate person tells you how the ski feels, then that's gonna be valid for you. Or maybe they have a better ski style lineup than I have, right? Maybe some intermediate skier skis the same way you do, have a similar build. Look at their opinion too. I have never once said like, you have to buy skis. I always say like, go out and test them yourself. I'm just trying to weed it down so that you can kind of filter down to skis to try. And if you want to buy skis, sure, if you're willing to be that risky. But this guy from Stokely, I couldn't believe this was written. And how do I know he works for Stokely? Well, I did a Google search with his name and Stokely because he was only commenting on Stokely videos. Stuff that was posted months ago, ancient, where he must have been searching for Stokely. And I had a feeling he was talking very technically. He was talking about things that looked like it was from an advertisement for Stokely. And what do I find? I find his LinkedIn, where he is a sales rep for Stokely and a couple other brands. Again, I'm not trying to call this guy out in particular. It's, you know, it's almost Christmas. People have families. I don't want anyone to lose their job. But Stokely Stokely, this is embarrassing. You guys shouldn't be having salespeople leave messages on small YouTubers. This channel's grown considerably. I think when he left this comment, there was like 100 subscribers, now there's 1,000. But no matter what, why would you ever have a salesperson go and punch down on a user who's talking about their experience? And I was talking positively about your skis. <laughs> it makes me wonder if I even wanna work with Stokely in the future, honestly. If I do, it probably will be in the setting of like, I find a demo pair somewhere but this put a really bad taste in my mouth and it needed to be called out. So I have had a similar issue with this, being a small content creator and just being told to keep my mouth shut and that I wasn't qualified to give an opinion. And it's like with me, I know I'm qualified. I've got more credentials than most people should even have. I get hyper fixated on this stuff and I like talking about it, but it's bad form and I would hate to see other ski content creators in the future get demeaned and deterred from sharing their opinion. The other brand that did some weird stuff was Peak Skis. I've obviously had my video about how I was skeptical about the skis, how they don't want to send me anything to try. On Instagram, they were talking like, oh yeah, yeah, let's look, can you send us your channel? Great. And then as soon as they saw my channel being critical of Bomber, they totally ghosted me. The new thing is I've had several Peak Ski sales reps go on my LinkedIn and view my profile. Now, I went and sent them a connection request. I was like, hey, let's talk. You know what, like, I, I wanna try your skis. Maybe I'll really like them. Let's talk, I'm open. And they wanted no connection, and I think the message they were trying to send me was, we found you. We can find your employer. We can talk to them, you know? And, <laughs> you know, I'm in a unique position where 
I provide care for my child who has a disability. I am a stay-at-home parent. There's nobody to tattle on for me, okay? <laughs> Yeah, there's no way you're gonna intimidate me. I'm here to tell people the truth about what I feel with skis. So, peak skis, if that was an intimidation tactic, it was in bad form. If it wasn't, maybe it's a misunderstanding. I would love to talk with you guys, but I've seen a lot of this. I've seen a lot of different companies go, oh, well, are you even qualified to talk about skis? And yes, I am, in fact. <laughs> I'm overqualified, but Somebody who doesn't have my background, who didn't do BMA Junior program, who didn't work for Ski Racing Magazine, who isn't a certified USSA coach, their opinion is just as valid as mine and they should be able to talk about this stuff without companies harassing them. This video, I saw it recently about pink bike. I don't know, it struck a chord with me because I've been experiencing this a lot as a new creator. As I've grown, I've noticed that they've kind of been quieter and aren't harassing me as much, but man, early on, it wasn't pretty. The rest of the companies, I will say, have been really nice. I've talked with reps from Head, I talked with reps from Atomic, I've talked with a bunch of people in the industry and they've been really nice. And so I do wanna say that there's some really good actors. It's been the majority really positive, but the harassment on these social media platforms with people who are tied to the companies is honestly embarrassing. Let's keep going with the video. HD6s all day long. I just think that that they really missed the mark in this in interview. If Kaz and Henry are you, if you're watching this, I would love to just like really drive home the point that you like mountain biking. I like mountain biking. All the other mountain bike creators out there love mountain biking. And we all want to show that to people and share that with people in different ways. But the content that you guys produce and you hit publish on is exactly precisely equally as valuable as the content that anybody else puts out with as far as like the value prospect. You don't know what people are gonna find valuable and not valuable. But yeah, for you people who love mountain biking and you're dipping your toes into content creation, keep going. What you're doing is fantastic. It is valued. I cannot wait to see where you're gonna ride next. And I'm really stoked to be part of this community myself. Thanks for listening to me rant for a little while, everybody. Cheers. I also want to say what a cool video like it's so easy to kind of as a content creator have your eyes up but this person is looking back at people who are kind of following the same trajectory as him and saying like hey like keep making content you, you know it's easy to be like super focused on the future and not realize that there are people you can help i think this is also a good moment to show a bit of appreciation for people that i've reached out to in the industry um there's been a couple of them but specifically ski essentials I reached out to them kind of early on when I was still pretty small and just, you know, said, hey, do you guys have any interest in collabing? You know, I've been reacting to a lot of your content. Do you want to get on a call and just talk? And they were super nice. Not only were they encouraging, but they also were like, hey, you know, here's some tips. I was like, hey, I'm, I'm having a hard time getting follow cam footage. What do you do? And they said, okay, use this equipment. This works really well. This is what we've experienced. And they took time out of their day to talk to me that they didn't need to. Like, I want to say Jeff was probably on his lunch break or something and they've been nothing but nice to me and so I guess I just wanted to say that I'm really grateful seeing the bike community really makes me go like ugh, yuck really makes me appreciate more the ski community I've only interacted with a couple of creators but everybody has been super nice I guess I just wanted to express some gratitude they had a video out recently on their live stream where they talked about me they said, you know, we like Elliot, he's nice. It was a little weird at first, felt like being audited. And that's fair, right? I get that these reaction videos <laughs> can probably feel a little intrusive, but I just wanted to show appreciation for them because while they may have felt like I was prying in, they've also been really encouraging and it seems like they care about the ski community at large. So I just want to take a moment to say that I'm appreciative of them. Maybe I'll show the clip, maybe I won't, but they didn't have to be that encouraging. As far as pink bike goes, I don't know. To me, it looks like people clambering and scraping and holding on to any bit of relevance they can. And they're kind of intimidated because they talk about TikTok and Instagram. It's people being like, oh, well, this intermediate guy who did a funny skit is getting way more views than me and I'm a pro and I'm supposed to be better at everything. That's not how it works. That's not what people care about. <laughs> people have real lives outside of biking, right? I posted a meme on Instagram that was so basic. It took like maybe 30 seconds to make and it has almost half a million views. Do you know how frustrating that is to spend like an hour on editing a full length video and then have <laughs> a 10 second Instagram reel go viral? But you know what? That's okay, who cares? You don't have to clamber to your relevance that much and there's room for experts, intermediates and everyone in between. 
this guy, Lone Ranger. If you're into biking, go go check this guy out. He has some great content. Anyway, this has been a longer video than I planned, but I thought it was really cool to talk about. So again, thank you to Lone Ranger. Thank you to Ski Essentials. Thanks to everyone in between who's been nice. Even Lucas Cadiana, that guy has like talked to me about different cameras and what to use. Also a cool guy, go check him out. But more than anything, thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate that you guys are willing to listen to a guy who's underneath the jungle gym when he talks about skis. But you know what? I don't care what these companies say. I'm gonna tell you the truth, no matter what. And as always, just thanks for being part of it. I really appreciate it. I'll see you in the next one. See ya.